Because it's going to be David Zetland. Who is this guy? Sit down quietly or relax. Sit back. Great. What's David going to do for us? He's a senior water economist in the Department of Environmental Economics and Natural Resources at Wageningen University, so it's a home game for him. And uh, he's working on an EU-funded project evaluating economic policy instruments for sustainable water management in Europe. These names are always gross, aren't they? He blogs a lot on water, economics, and politics, and he's the author of The End of Abundance, Economic Solutions to Water Scarcity. I know the NEO is watching now. Well, maybe the NEO is watching all day, but I know they, they wanted to hear about this one. He's passionate about making it easier for people to accomplish their goals, improving the ways we interact with each other and enjoying the beauty of the natural and human world. I'm going to leave to him what he's going to speak about. There he is, David Zetlin. Okay. Hello. That was a great, great start. Thanks for hanging in there, everybody. Um, I'm going to be speaking about string. And uh, actually, I'm going to be talking about something super important to everybody here, choices. And in particular, not choices in chocolate, but the way that choices make our lives better. Or as the environmentalists and ecologists would say, the way that choices have made our ecosystems richer and more robust and made us happier people on this planet. Now the question is, what's the connection between Nutella and, now I've got to do three things here. Put on the shirt. Can you hear me still? No, mic up. hear me now? Okay, so the question is, what's the connection between Nutella and bugs, or Nutella and ecosystems? And what I'm, the, the way I think about it is that if, if you have a, a producer of a products, they're going to push products out in the marketplace. And uh, that push is going to give consumers choices. And consumers are going to pull on one product, which means they're not pulling on another. You see the relative move here? If you have an ecosystem, you have a bug that's getting more successful. It's eating more of the, of the food, for example, and that bug will take over the territory of the other bug. So the competition for those spaces and markets or ecosystems is uh, resulting in, in uh, a better fit, resulting in uh, better outcomes for consumers, better outcomes for the ecosystem. But at the same time, it's, it's punishing failure, right? And what you get is a, a virtuous cycle. You get innovation. You get all kinds of... Uh, benefits for either marketplaces or ecosystems, and that's because of this kind of dynamic of, of pushing uh, uh, from the from the either the producers and pulling from the consumers, or pushing from the species and pulling from the ecosystems in those niches, and that has served us quite well. Now, the I have to manipulate everything. Pushing on a string actually is what happens when you don't have any choices. And you have basically this kind of choice where there's only one choice there. And there's no dynamic. There's no good or bad. All you have is this choice. And the only way to give feedback is to push on a string. In fact, to give no feedback at all. Now, why does this, where, where does this dynamic happen? It happens when you have a monopoly. And a monopoly is going to tell you what to do. And they're going to say, this is the only option you have. And it turns out that that option is not necessarily sensitive to what you need. It's not necessarily going to give you the choices that you want. And the thing that's interesting is that that's actually how the water business works in most parts of the world. For thousands of years, we've had very good water managers who are pushing to us the, way, the water services that they think we need. And that has worked for a long time because there was always enough water for everybody. But the, t the theme that I work on, the title of my book, The End of Abundance, is that we don't have enough water for everybody anymore. Now we're facing 
a push system, the water system, whether it's uh, uh, urban, residential, agricultural, industrial, that system has been designed to push water to us and it's not necessarily designed to get customer feedback. There is no feedback in the water system. I don't even know, does anybody here even know anyone who's in the water department or do you just turn it on and you hope it's there, right? But you might know the, your favorite brand of, of Nutella you might, or, or chocolate spread. You might know your, your favorite um, fruits that you want to get. I want to have an apple today and not a banana. But in the water system, it's always been pushed to us. And that now is a problem because there's just not enough water to be pushed out there. And now what, we're, what, what I'm going to talk about is trying to bring more of the, the, the dynamic of choice that we're used to in markets and the, the results that we see in ecosystems into the water business. And what I want to do is I want to give you some examples of that so that we can think of new ways of managing water, essentially to get more out of the, the limited water we have. And this is a problem all around the world. So uh, here's one of my favorite cities. Anybody recognize this city? Las Vegas, right? It's actually, if you didn't know, a desert. And they've got a pyramid, that's good, uh, but they also have you know, a castle and Paris is in there somewhere. And in Las Vegas, they have, they sell you water very cheaply and then they tell you how to use it. So in Las Vegas, a cubic meter of water, a thousand liters costs 25 cents. In Amsterdam, where I live, it's a dollar, or, sorry, one euro 25. So it's five times more expensive to get water in Amsterdam than it is to get water here. And somewhat surprisingly, or not, if you're an economist, the water consumption in Las Vegas is roughly 400 liters per person per day. And in Amsterdam, it's roughly 80. So the price is five times higher in Amsterdam. The consumption is five times higher in Las Vegas. And what do they do? They say, we're going to sell you that water very cheaply, but you can't water your lawn between 11 o'clock and 5 o'clock. Otherwise, we'll give you a ticket. And if you do want to uh, rip out your lawn, we'll pay you to do that. Or if you want to put a cover on your pool, because a lot of people in Las Vegas have pools, then we'll pay you to put a cover on your pool. But we're not going to change the price of water. We're not going to raise that price up. Like in Amsterdam, as far as I know, no one tells me how to use my water in Amsterdam. I might feel like I want to do something that's good, but I do it because I want to. I do what I want to in Amsterdam because I have, I am doing the pull. I have, the, the water system is run sustainably. I do whatever I feel like. In Las Vegas, they're like, here's our system. Use the cheap water. Oh, no, sorry, don't use the cheap water. And that's how Las Vegas is in perennial water crisis. That's one example. But what about the bulk water system? What about water for farmers and agriculture? Everybody talks about more crop per drop, right? We do care about that. And in California, I'm using an example from there, there were two sets of farmers. There were farmers here and there were farmers here. They were literally separated by a river. And these farmers didn't have very much water and these farmers had a lot of water. And these farmers said, hey, we want to sell water to these farmers. And I went and I talked to a politician in California. I said, hey, how about you let these guys sell water to these guys? And the politician said, no, I don't want to do that. I would prefer to tell farmers how to use their water. In fact, farmers have too much water. I prefer that water runs down the river and goes somewhere else. So these guys who were buying their water for about uh, $50, let's say, were not able to sell water to these guys that were buying water for $500. These guys were saying, we'll sell you water. And the politician was like, no, this is a, push, this is a system. We're going to manage it. We're not going to let you guys make a trade. And so what these guys did is said, fine, we're going to grow subsidized cotton in the desert, very popular crop. And these guys here, they actually went to the media. We have our famous Governor Schwarzenegger. And what we had in, in, is it was a, a, not just a media circus, not just political interference, not just bills that were being introduced in the Congress, even yet today. This is three years later. They are still fighting over this water where those farmers were happy to fix that problem three years ago just by making a, a trade of mutual advantage. But the, the system was like, no, we're going to do it this way, and this is what has happened, and it's not fixed, by the way. I, I could make my career on this one problem, but it's just not fixed. So this is not serving anybody. But how can a system work where farmers are trading water? This is actually an example from Australia, uh, and it's an irrigation district, and these are the, the water deliveries here. Not very much. Oops, we have a drought, right? We have a problem. 
But what happens in Australia is the farmers can tra trade water with each other. They don't have to go and get political permission. They've reformed their system over several steps. They've made it easier for farmers to, to trade with each other. And that means that when the water drops down, the, the milk production drops, but it didn't drop by as much. And way more importantly, the farmers who wanted to keep producing milk could produce milk. The farmers who wanted money instead of water or milk could take the money. It was a, a relatively frictionless system, certainly compared to the crazy stuff that goes on in California. California is crazy for lots of reasons, including water. So that's an example of a of, of pull compared to the push that we were worried about. Now, the poor people, a lot of people are, are concerned about water for the poor in the developing world especially. And there's a Millennium Development Goal trying to bring more water service to people. And this goal was designed by uh, a large bureaucracy. And what they said when the first Millennium Development Goal was, was written, they said, we want to bring more clean water to poor people around the world so they can drink it. And then when they implemented that system, what they ended up doing is saying, no, what we want to do is we're going to bring, we're going to bring access to a water source and that's going to be the definition of success. And, and when they said access, they didn't mean clean water, and they didn't mean a water source in your house. They actually meant water, a pipe of water within 200 meters of your house. If you were urban, that was successful. Or within a, a, a not difficult distance of your house if you lived in the countryside. This, I don't know what not difficult was, but the bureaucrats did. So this is how they defined water solutions for the poor. And uh, it was defined from the EU level, and guess what? All these countries around the world that wanted to raise their rankings in the tables, they started putting pipes every 200 meters. No matter what the quality of the water was, it was in those pipes. So what did the poor do? That was the push solution, right? What did the poor do? They get their own bloody water, right? They buy it from a kiosk, 20 liters at a time. And the kiosks are for-profit enterprises. They're cleaning that water with lots of filters. They're selling it. This is in Jakarta. I took this picture. And they sell it, and the, and the people there are saying, I don't know what this millennium system is, but I need to drink, right? Same thing. I'm going to have bottled water, which is the, you know, people are like, oh my God, bottled water is so evil. Not to these people. This is staying alive. This is not getting sick, right? This is so you can go to work. And this is a solution to a pull solution. They're, they're buying this, you know, pure capitals, and they're buying this because the, the, the system is not delivering to them. They're, the push system is not delivering to what they want. So that's how the poor are, are responding to their water needs. And here's, I think, probably the whole story in a picture. This is the population with access in less developed countries, and this red line is mobile phones. And this line here is water to your house, which I think most people here consider to be a good idea, right? Water within 200, or 20, 200 meters of your house is up here. But what you see here is pull. Around the world, people in developing countries love phones, and there is a lot of competition to deliver phones that those people want to pay for. And this is the pull system and what it's delivering to poor people. And this is the push system and what it's delivering or not delivering to poor people. Now, who benefits from this system? The push system benefits the water managers who have their job security, the politicians who control access to the limited amount of water that there is. In developing countries, you have cities where the only people who have the tap water are actually the rich people. The poor people buy it for 10 times more uh, price off, off the truck. And of course, those rich people who, and the powerful people who control access to those things. Who loses? Well, we know, right? The people who don't get water service, but also the environment loses, right? And all of our, uh, our health and our societies, there's a lot of uh, uh, problems, political problems that come from that. So I want to leave you with that. And I want to say that I want to have, ooh, look, I want to have more pull. And less, ooh, chocolate. Less push in this world so that we can have a more strong economy, we can have a healthier environment, and we can have happier people.